Hello, I'm Stephen and today I'm going to be talking about indifference curves and the Edgeworth Bowley box in microeconomics. So we wanted to start with um, indifference curves because that's, uh, that concept is part of the Edgeworth Bowley box um, over the other side of the whiteboard. So you start off with just one consumer who maximizes what's called utility, the satisfaction for goods. Now the utility function for two goods, and that's one of our assumptions, two goods, uh, one representation is utility function equals um, utility of all the goods um, that are available to that consumer. So if there was more than two goods, you would list the rest of the goods um, in this function. Um, our other um, assumption is there's limited resources. One of the key um, assumptions of economics as a whole. Therefore, the, uh, you can make set combinations of goods on the indifference curves. I'll just get to that uh, very soon. Finish with the assumptions. And there's a budget constraint. So you buy the goods in the market for a price given your income level and that, that straight line is the price ratio of the two goods, price A and price B. Okay, so now we can get to what is an indifference curve. It's the choice, the bundle between two uh, uh, well goods and all the combinations of those goods. So one bundle might be here and that just shows the uh, level of good there, B1, and the combination of A that that person has chosen. He or she could move up the indifference curve for more of good A and less of good B. There's a trade-off, um, opportunity cost. Um, there's a choice between the two, so that consumer trades off between more of one good, less of the other good, or conversely, more of the other good and less of the other one. So, um, op opportunity cost. Now, the rate of change of that indifference curve is called marginal utility. And marginal utility is the rate of change between it's, it's, a, it's a precise mathematical, me mathematical measurement of the rate of change um, of the choice of giving up the two goods on a small section of the indifference curve. It's also uh, precisely the first derivative of the utility function. If you can find the first derivative of the utility function, that's the rate of change of the utility function, which is marginal utility. So, uh, this tangency point between the indifference curve, oh, and I also should, yeah, the tangency is, uh, is where um, the equilibrium is for that consumer, a partial equilibrium. The tangency between the indifference curve and the budget constraint. I also should say that marginal rate of substitution, MRS, is a ratio of the marginal utility of good A over the marginal utility of good B, the other good, um, and that's termed marginal rate of substitution. An approximation um, is a, a small, very small change of A along the curve and a very small change in B. So, um, like considering um, that small right angle triangle, that little change in good A there, over that little change of good B, okay? And I did men mention this in another presentation. Um, so where that tangency is, that partial equilibrium, that's where marginal rate of substitution equals the price ratio. That's that point there. 
where MRS equals to the price ratio, the price of good A over the price of good B. B, uh, B. Obviously, uh, MUA, MUA over MUB holds as well because that is um, MR, MRS. There's also a term called diminishing. Now, with consumers, um, the, the more uh, satisfaction they get, utility from goods, the better off they are. So they want a higher um, indifference curve. They'd like the indifference curve to shift out at another one. So that's U0, that's U1. They'd like to get there. Uh, they can uh, um, if they've got more resources at their disposal. But if they shift in, they don't like it. So an inefficient point would be here be, uh, because that consumer could get a higher utility and go to the indifference curve. But um, a point here, if they've only got that level of resources, that indifference curve, that's unattainable, um, unreachable for that consumer because um, there aren't enough resources available. Dimishing, diminishing marginal utility is when, um, uh, say you go to Hungry Jack's and you have three double whopper burgers, that's obviously too much for your stomach, and your marginal utility for the second and third hamburger will drop off dramatically, diminishing marginal utility. So that's the best way I can describe the concept of diminishing marginal utility. Over the whiteboard we go, and I'll just double check that um, I've got camcorder in the right spot. That's okay. So now we're going to in introduce in we welfare economics, the concept of the Edgeworth Bowley box. Now we're incorporating two consumers and they can trade with each other, Jack and Jill. So the Edgeworth Bowley box was put forward by a, a Cambridge University in the UK, Francis Edgeworth, and he met and worked a bit with Arthur Bowley, who was also at Cambridge. He put that forward in 18, back in 1881. Bowley, um, an econ economist and a statistician, uh, worked on it um, um, with additional con concepts in 1906. And so, yeah, two consumers, Jack and Jill, agents who can trade with each other. So as long as both gain from the trade, um, that's why people trade, they want to gain. That's why countries trade, they want to gain, according to comparative advantage. Um, gain from the trade. Again, um, still we're, we're, we're stuck with limited resources and opportunity costs between the two goods. So with Jack, that's his choice of good A and his choice of good B. But with Jill, her choice of good A is along here and uh, good B is long th uh, there. So good A is opposite, um, good A uh, are opposites in the box and so is good B. So don't mix that around. The origin point O is that point there where both consumers start from and then they choose their bundle of good. Now, these are Jack's utility curves, U1, U2 and U3. U3 is the highest he can go. Um, similarly, Jill's utility functions are U1, U2 and U3. U3 is also the highest she can go, but they're facing different ways. Okay, That's Jack's indif final indifference curve, that's Jill's final indifference curve. They cross each other at two points X and Y. So, what happens now is um, if they're at the, the uh, as far as they can go with the indifference curves out to get the, the, the best combination of good A and B, given their resources, now they're in a position to trade. They might want to agree on a trade between each other from X to Y, and as long as both gain, that's termed a Pareto improvement. 
if they go from X to Y and both agents gain from the trade, a Pareto improvement. And uh, then they, after the trade, they finish up at Y. Okay? So that's after the trade. That's the in initial endowment. That's the point after the trade. Y. From X to Y. Initial endowment to after the trade. Uh, again, um, the, say Jack's indifference curve was U2. If, if, if his choice of goods was here, that, that would be inefficient. He could move to there. And again, that point would be unattainable if we were only considering U2 indifference curve. Now, um, we've got to get to general equilibrium, which is equilibrium for two agents in this cl uh, simple closed economy. And so we call it general equilibrium. And the absolute final place they can uh, meet and tr uh, trade is this final indifference curve which is also adjacent to the price schedule PA over PB. That term, that tangency between both their indifference curves, Jack and Jill, and the price ratio, that point there is termed Pareto optimality. Or um, it's also called Pareto efficiency. At that point, the marginal rate of substitution of Jack is equal to the marginal rate of substitution of Jill, which is also equal to the price ratio P over P, PA over PB. And um, they can't uh, move any more than that, uh, that, that tangency. Um, if uh, Jack was to go here, Jill would be worse off. If Jill was to go here, Jack would be worse off. So that's the final resting pl place of uh, the, the trade and where, where they can go with their combinations of good Pareto optimality. So I'll just bring this uh, whiteboard over. Just got to mount the whiteboard on these screws up here. Perhaps I should have chosen the other one for the introductory concepts. And I'll just double check. Camcorder's all right. That's fine. Now in the textbooks, if you see this term contract curve, it's the locus of all the uh, Pareto optimal points between Jack and Jill. It's called a contract uh, curve. All those points are Pareto optimal because there's a tangency of the two indifference cur curves. However, they might not be equitable that, that one seems to be skewed to Jill, and that one seems to be skewed to Jack. So equity is a consideration in this model as well. So all the Pareto optimal outcomes after trade, uh, where agents gain Pareto improvements, benefits from trade. At Pareto efficiency, they can't um, gain any more u utility uh, given um, a budget constraint. Now, later in the timeline in the 20th century, John Nash in the US did some additional um, research on the Edgeworth Bowley box. And he added that agents both gain from tr trade and they don't trade if one um, loses out. But there, um, there still might be inequity in the model between the two agents. So they only trade if they uh, both gain. If one loses, they don't trade. Now, Nash in incorporated game theory, strategy, uh, different payoffs um, into the model, and um, he, he, he brought zero-sum game into it. An example of uh, zero-sum game was put forward by Flood and Drescher in 1950 called The Prisoner's D Dilemma. And Nash was kind of very similar in thinking as well on zero-sum game. It involves some bargaining negotiation, some mistrust, uh, maybe different strategies. 
the, the example of prisoner's dilemma is two prisoners locked in the same cell in prison uh, waiting for their trial and if they uh, both cheat and tell stories to the court and lie to the court and make an agreement, both win. They both get lighter sentences. However, what happens is prisoner B wants to cheat on the agreement with prisoner A and um, he, he will gain um, from cheating uh, from the, the prisoner's agreement. Um, similarly, prisoner A will want to cheat on the, that original agreement too and win and um, cheat on the other guy. What ends up happening is both of them cheat and uh, I should change this actually. I should have, that should be the same because that guy is actually winning and the other guy is losing. But what happens is both end up losing and they both get uh, long um, lengthy sentences because they've both cheated on the original agreement and the whole story is broken down in court. So um, that's some concepts brought forward by Nash um, inequity about when they sh uh, when they should try and trade when they shouldn't zero sum game game theory and the prisoner's dilemma which was put forward by Flood and Drescher. So uh, mistrust different strategies. So I hope that um, helps you. Just recap on some terms. Know what Pareto efficiency or Pareto optimality is. Pareto. Um, was a, an Italian co economist, Vilfredo Pareto, who also worked in, on welfare economics, who had that tendency named after him. Um, consider a zero-sum game, prisoner's uh, dilemma. Know when agents should trade and when they shouldn't. Know what the contract uh, curve is. Also know the assumptions of the model and you should be okay. Um, know the formula for uh, general equilibrium for these two consumers. MRS equals uh, the price ratio. Uh, we've defined utility function, marginal rate of utility. What is the marginal rate of substitution? So um, this uh, topic is okay and then you've got to do the production function one with isoquants as well and also the uh, the one on uh, production possibility frontier which I've covered in another presentation. So that's the end of the presentation from Stephen um, in uh, Sydney. Um, I'm from TFAT and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and found it informative. Thank you. Bye.